In chapter seven, we switch from alkenes to now looking at alkynes, okay, which are less common than alkenes, but still undergo a lot of reactions. Okay, you'll see a lot of similarities to chapter six. And then at the end of chapter seven, we're going to get an introduction to multi-step synthesis, seeing how we can use alkynes to build carbon chains okay, and then introduce some of the reactions for synthetic applications as we kind of teased at the end of chapter six. So by now you know what an alkyne is, right? Anything with a CC triple bond. So we see that triple bond in each of these naturally occurring alkynes. And right, while they're less common, that pi bond, two pi bonds, right, allows them to undergo a lot of the principles of reactivity that we saw in chapter five and six because they have those loosely held pi electrons. And we need to know how to name this functional group, right? Anytime we get a new functional group, we get new nomenclature. A general formula now with two pi bonds, if it is an acyclic, right, so a linear alkyne, just one triple bond, it's CnH2n minus two. Okay? But if you introduce a ring, you lose two more hydrogens as well for that. So your CnH2n minus four, okay? Just like with alkenes, you number the chain in whatever direction gives you the lower number for the functional group. And our alkynes have a Y-N-E, an ein suffix. Okay. So again, we're just worried about systematic names here. I'm not gonna bother talking about the common names. Uh, where these are things that have a minimum of two degrees of unsaturation. And one new term that I want you to be on the lookout for is a terminal versus an internal alkyne, because that's gonna be important for our synthetic applications. If the CC triple bond is at the end of the molecule, like we see here in one butyne, that is a terminal alkyne. If it's anywhere else, right, like here or here, to the inside of the molecule, it's called an internal alkyne. Okay. Nothing new here. Right, same as alkenes, if you can number it in two possible directions and they give the same possible low number for the functional group, we number the chain so that it gets the lower number in the name, right? So then you start to look at your suffixes. But with that in mind, in chapter seven, now that we've got a whole bunch of functional groups to consider, now we're gonna talk about how to name things with multiple functional groups that are controlling the suffix in the same molecule. So if we see a bunch of molecules here with multiple functional groups, two alkenes here and here, two alkynes over here. Okay. Well, we said before those are called dienes or dienes, but as we'll see in just a couple slides here, right, how, does that, how does that affect my nomenclature where these things are? Okay. So let's consider a couple of rules here. If I have an alkene with a sec second functional group, but it's not another double bond, because if it was just another double bond, I'd give it two numbers and call it a diene. In that case, two functional groups, both controlling the suffix, I have to find my longest continuous carbon chain that contains both of the functional groups. That's the key thing. If you're jotting down notes, underline that, both functional groups. And then both suffixes go at the end of the name. We put en first for the alkene, Drop the E at the end right there, because we don't like adjacent vowels in nomenclature. And then add the suffix for something like an alcohol, an OL, or an amine, amine, right? So because we are typically putting the alkene first, right, the number that's coming before the name of the parent chain is typically gonna correspond to the location of the alkene because the number indicating the location of the first stated functional group goes before the name of the parent chain. The location of the second functional group goes just before the suffix. Right? So if I look at 2 but one all here, right? one, two, three, four gives me butane. It goes to butene, and then I get the OL from the alcohol. 2 butin tells me the EN here starts at carbon 2, right there. Oh, sorry, right here. And then one OL tells me the alcohol is on 
carbon one. Okay. So butan four, En double bond, starting at C2, and then the alcohol is on C1. Notice I'm not going two, one, butanol. I, this is a situation where you have to put a number right before the suffix when you have multiple functional groups. Okay. Now, what about if I have a double bond and a triple bond? I've got something that wants to name it en and another one that wants to end it ein, right? E N E and Y N E. In that situation, I'm going to number the chain in a direction that produces a name with the lowest number, provided it has both the double bond and the triple bond in it. And then I go EN number YNE. So this number that comes first tells me where the double bond starts, and then the number that comes second tells me where the triple bond starts, always going for the lowest possible number in the name. Okay. If you get that same low number going both ways, then you give the lower number to the double bond, only if it's a tie. Okay. You always look for the lowest possible number, but if you can go left to right or right to left, and you get the same low number both ways, then you give it to the double bond, okay. but only if there's a tie which is what this slide here is showing us, right? You can look at those two for practice on slide 13. And our final rule, the one we're going to encounter most often, uh, if we have a second functional group with a higher priority than an alkene suffix, and you'll see what I mean on the next slide with regard to priority, you number the chain in whatever direction assigns the lower number to the functional group that has the higher priority suffix. So to say that differently, look at this table here, 7.1 from your textbook. You have to know this for nomenclature. Okay. A carbonyl is at the top, followed by an alcohol, followed by an amine, followed by a double bond and a triple bond. Okay. So if you have two or three of these in the same molecule, right, the lower number goes to whatever has the higher priority. So if you have a carbonyl, that's going to control it. An alcohol or an amine, you're going to target those and give those the lower numbers before you worry about an alkene and an alkyne, right, which are considered to be the same priority, unless, as we saw in rule four, you have both of them in the same molecule and there's a tie, in which case you give it to the alkene, which is why there's an equal, it would only be greater than if there's a tie. So let's take an example of those. I've got a alkene, I've got an alcohol. I want the lower number to go to the alcohol. Over here, I've got an alkene and I have an amine. I want the lower name to go to the amine. And so this is a really great slide for practice. I recommend you pause this video, slide 16, and work through each of those for practice. Make sure you understand where the names are coming from, or better yet, block them off. Just look at the structure and practice writing the name out yourself. So now let's go back to alkynes, finish by considering the structure of these things. Uh, we've got two carbons in an alkyne that are sp hybridized, meaning they have two sp hybrid orbitals that are forming sigma bonds and two p orbitals that are overlapping to form the pi bonds. And considering VSEPR, they're 180 degrees apart with regard to the geometry to minimize the repulsion. They've got a nice strong bond, a shorter bond relative to alkenes, right? As we get more pi bonds, we get shorter and stronger, uh, but we still have the pi bonds, which is gonna control the reactivity for the rest of the chapter. What well, physical properties? Uh, well, our boiling point increases with increasing molecular weight, okay? As it gets heavier, the boiling point gets higher. These tend to be insoluble in water, but soluble in nonpolar solvents like dichloromethane, and they tend to be less dense than water. Now you see the explanation as for why below. It's all about polarizability, which we've talked about in previous chapters. And so one quick note to leave off on, alkyl groups stabilize alkynes the same way they did alkenes. Remember in chapter five, we talked about the more alkyl groups on an alkene, the more stable it is. It's the same thing for an alkyne, 
but really we're just thinking about one versus two alkyl groups, unless you have the case of ethyne, which has none. Okay. An internal alkyne has an alkyl group on each carbon. And so that's gonna be more stable than a terminal alkyne, which just has one alkyl group and then a hydrogen on the other. Nice table of our physical properties. So you see the general trend here. As they get heavier, the boiling point increases, which is the big takeaway for that. Now, you probably are comfortable with the physical properties. If you've got this far in the course, the big takeaway from this video is gonna be all about that nomenclature. Naming an alkyne on its own, anything on this screen, not difficult. But what you do need to worry about is having those functional groups. So no table 7.1, right? How to rank those priorities and know how to be careful with your numbers, where to put them. Does it become before the parent alkene? Does it come before the suffix? And make sure you practice your nomenclature before the exam for chapter seven.